Hello, I'm Colonel Janet Munn here in London, England at the International College for Officers and Center for Spiritual Life Development, where we're hosting our first ever International College for Soldiers. Our special guest lecturer is Dr. Roger Green, a senior soldier from the USA Eastern Territory. Dr. Green is professor of Biblical and Theological Studies at Gordon College, where he's the chair of that department. And he's teaching today on the Kingdom of God from the New Testament, and also on the Theology of Catherine Booth from Salvation Army History. Let's join them now as Dr. Green teaches on the Kingdom of God. But while we're studying, study is the highest form of worship. While you're studying the scripture, you are at worship. We are at worship this morning as we're studying scripture together. And so that's important, uh, really important to remember. So as I mentioned, all of these things I talk about in my various uh, Bible studies because it's kind of an introduction of how important Bible study is. Let's talk about the sessions we're going to be taking a look at. Um, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God, the message, in just a, just a moment. We'll get into that. And this morning, we'll at least get started on the parables of the kingdom. Now, I'm watching my time, and we're kind of uh, guiding our, our time together here. And so we're going to be picking and choosing, as we mentioned. Uh, but if we need to go over into the next session a little bit on the parables, we'll do that. Because in the second session, we're going to specifically talk about the kingdom of God in terms of the miracles and the kingdom of God and the law. And then in the third session, we'll be talking about the kingdom of God and Paul's ministry and message and the kingdom of God and the Salvation Army. So in a sense, for each session, we've got two objectives for each, each time we're together. So we want to talk about that. So here now we start with the message of the kingdom of God. And uh, if you'll turn to the Gospel of Mark, and we'll start with that. <clears throat> and again, uh, you have these in your, in your outline. And so um, the outline, I hope, will be helpful to you. But if you look at Mark and the, the very beginning of Mark. And we'll just mention here Mark 1, 1 through 8, because this is the ministry, of course, of John the Baptist. So for sake of time, we'll look at 7 and 8. Um, it kind of leads in, Mark leads into this in a beautiful way, but we'll look at Mark 1, 7 and 8. And he preached, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so we have, at the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, we have this wonderful, beautiful, and rather quick, actually, it only takes a few verses, that rather quick story of this ministry, of this forerunner of Jesus, uh, who's going to bring about, in a sense, the ministry of Jesus and point to the ministry of Jesus. And then Jesus will come into his own ministry. And if you look at the Galilean ministry here, Mark 1, 14 and 15, this is what's absolutely critical here in those two verses. Uh, those two verses are so important, but Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, the reason for this great uh, proclamation is that this is the definition of the gospel. We always say we want to preach the gospel or we believe in the gospel. Well, when we say that, what do we mean by that? Well, Jesus has explicitly told us what we mean by that. He tells us what the gospel is. And he said, I'm preaching the gospel. And he said, here's the gospel. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in that gospel. So that is the glorious gospel, the kingdom of God. And I'm afraid that sometimes when we study the New Testament and we describe gospel in other ways, which is fine to do, but I'm afraid that sometimes we forget that the essence of the gospel, the good news is the kingdom of God is at hand. So repent and believe in that good news, believe in that gospel. So Jesus really gives us right at the very beginning of his ministry, he tells us what his ministry message and ministry are going to be all about. And then as we look at the parables and as we look at the miracles and as we look at Jesus and the law, it's those things are all about the kingdom of God. They all point in some way to the kingdom of God, as does the preaching of Jesus. So when we're talking about Jesus and the kingdom of God, we're talking about what is central to the gospel, what is central to the good news uh, that the kingdom of God has now come into our midst. Now we should, so there's the preaching of Jesus, but we should look at the result of his preaching. We'll look at, at if you'll turn over to uh, Luke chapter 4, 
four, uh, chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, at one result of his preaching. And then we'll look at 28 through 30. So, the Gospel of Luke. Mark doesn't have this specifically, so Luke, that's why we have to turn to Luke to get some help here. But Luke 4, 14 and 15, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and a report concerning him went out throughout the surrounding country. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So the, he's got this great message, the kingdom of God is at hand. He goes back home. He begins preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God in all of their synagogues. But now, look at the end of the story in 428 through 30. If you just skip down. And he's preaching, of course, this great long sermon from the book of Isaiah. And he's, um, and he's applying the, the words of the prophet Isaiah to himself in that sermon. And by the way, Isaiah is the prophet who is most quoted in the New Testament. So the more you know about Isaiah... Uh, the more you're going to know about these New Testament references and Jesus preaches from Isaiah. But the result is not, I'm sorry to say, a very happy result. Look at 28. When they heard this, all the synagogues were filled with wrath, and they rose up and put him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down headlong. But passing through the midst of them, he went away. That's the result of his preaching. Nice sermon today, Pastor. Thank you very much for that sermon today, Pastor. We loved it. We really appreciate it. Uh, no, the first great sermon that he preached from the prophet Isaiah, they try to throw him over a hill. So this is not a good auspices for the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, is it? But that's, you will see time and time and time again when Jesus is preaching about the kingdom, teaching about the kingdom, uh, representing the kingdom, there will be conflict. And there are reasons for that conflict because Jesus, in preaching about the kingdom, will call into question the religious uh, traditions of his own people. And so uh, here in that first sermon and the results of the sermon uh, become kind of problematic. All right, what we want to do is uh, talk about um, the, um, the contrast, the message of this kingdom that Jesus has. And we'll, as you can see by our outline, we're going to mention three things. In a sense, the message of the kingdom of Jesus is a new vision for history. Jesus is bringing about, um, by his understanding of the kingdom, a new understanding of history, a new understanding of God's plan. God is the creator of this world. Uh, he's the creator of, of, of history, but a new understanding of where God is going here. So in this part of the outline, I just want to just mention three things. First of all, many people in the ancient world thought that history was going around in a circle. So there were lots of people for whom history was not going anywhere. There was no direction. There was no future. It was cyclical. Just going around in a circle, it, um, it, it, it had no direction at all to it. Now, a very pessimistic kind of view of history. And a lot of people in the ancient world felt that way. So they had no hope because there was no future. Now, some t I, this is only my own opinion, and, and, um, and so I'm just glad to share it with you. This may not be how you read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we won't turn to that passage just for sake of time, but you want to take a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Some people see Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 3 as very lovely, a lovely passage, you know, there's a... There's a season for everything, there's a season for this, and the time to do this, and the time to do that, and the time to do this, and the time to do that, as though God has providentially planned our lives in this really beautiful way. Now, in my own opinion, that's the wrong way to read Ecclesiastes 3, however, because Ecclesiastes 3 should not be read necessarily positively, but more negatively, because Ecclesiastes 3 is talking about this kind of cyclical view of history this view of history that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Now, it, we, this is not a Bible study on the book of Ecclesiastes, but you, we do want to just mention by the time you get to the end of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, the preacher breaks out of that cyclical view of history, becomes much more positive, and sees a future direction. But I'm just saying that sometimes in the Bible, there is this kind of cyclical view of history, and it's only by a new vision for who God is that, that we can break out of that. Um, but, and I would see Ecclesiastes 3 in that light, although many of you perhaps would not. When you come to the Old Testament, there is a much more positive view of history in the Old Testament. The thing, one of the things that separated 
the Hebrew people from their neighbors was that they did not generally see history in this kind of cyclical way, but they saw history moving toward the day of the Lord. And so you get in the Old Testament this great theme of the day of the Lord. And sometimes, as the Isaiah passage mentions, sometimes the day of the Lord will bring judgment to it. That's part of the work of the day of the Lord. But nevertheless, the Jewish people didn't generally see history as cyclical, but they saw history as moving forward to this great day of the Lord. So now Jesus, of course, is going to build on that, and that's the third part of that outline. When you come to the New Testament, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. And if there's any way to describe the kingdom of God, it is a present reality and it is a future hope. So he builds upon what the Jewish people would understand as the great day of the Lord. This is a great day of the Lord. Well, Jesus, in a sense, said, you're right, it's the day of the Lord, because that day of the Lord has broken into your lives in the kingdom of God. So everything that they looked forward to in the Old Testament in terms of the day of the Lord, uh, Jesus has now brought to them by his presence. And it's a present reality, but it's also a future hope, as we'll see. No doubt about that, so... Now, um, when a lot of what we'll be seeing here, there is a confrontation with the Jewish interpretation of, of, the, um, of the kingdom of God. There, there certainly were people around who thought about the kingdom of God, thought about what that kingdom might be. But what we'll have to see with Jesus is sometimes he will be confrontational about what this kingdom is all about because he understands the kingdom completely and fully because he is not just announcing the kingdom of God, he is the kingdom of God. So he has a full understanding of the kingdom that sometimes the people that he confronts do not. So if you just look at John chapter 2 for just a minute, and we'll see one of these times when he uh, will confront them. And uh, beginning at verse 13. You're familiar with this story, um, but for just sake of uh, looking at it, we'll read it. But John chapter 2, 13, and we'll read down to 22. The story is familiar, but John 2, 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business and making a whip of cords. He drove them all with the sheep and the oxen out of the temple and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for my house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign have you to show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. They believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now there's a confrontation. Uh, Jesus, uh, by the way, uh, we'll probably talk about this occasionally, but gentle Jesus, meek and mild, if you think of Jesus as there were times when Je Jesus was gentle and meek and mild, but there were times when that was not so. And this was one of them. Jesus is in confrontation. And he's in confrontation with their whole notion of the temple. Because they are thinking of the temple in terms of the second temple and Herod's modification of the second temple and beautif beautification of the second temple. Jesus, however, thinks of, of the temple in terms of himself not in terms of a place, but in terms of himself. Just as he'll think of the kingdom, not in terms of a place, but in terms of himself. And so there's this confrontation that takes place here. And by the way, it's interesting when Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, you know? Um, there's a lot of words you can use for temple in the New Testament. Uh, but one of the words you can use for temple is a word which literally means the holy of holies, that part of the temple where the high priest went uh, once a year on Yom Kippur to repent for his sins and the sins of all Israel, the Holy of Holies. Jesus could have used a lot of words to describe himself as the temple, but he doesn't. He uses the word which means the Holy of Holies. And he says, destroy this Holy of Holies, this Holy of Holies, that is God, you know, Jesus. Uh, God in Christ and so forth. So it's really pretty remarkable language here. And, um, but it's, it's very confrontational language because their understanding of the temple is going to be changed now. The temple is not a place, it's a person. 
the kingdom is not a place, it's a person. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of things are happening kind of in transition here. So. Okay, let's just mention, again, you can see this on your outline, but there are two meanings to the word uh, kingdom. So we'll just mention this, um, these two meanings here. First of all, the word kingdom in general means a, a, a reign or a rule. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, he means that the reign of God, the rule of God, has broken into your midst. And in general, that is how the word kingdom is going to be used in the New Testament. Uh, that's how it was used in classical Greek. That's how it's going to be used in the Greek that was you know, for the writing of the New Testament. So reign or rule. Now, secondarily, occasionally, um, uh, the word kingdom will mean a realm over which someone rules, over which some king rules. Um, that is usually not the way it's used in the New Testament, but I've given you a couple of occasions where the word kingdom is used as a, an actual place. Um, but when Jesus is talking about the kingdom, he's not usually talking about a place. Uh, he's usually talking about his authority to reign, his authority to rule uh, over the lives of his believers and so forth. So if you look, for example, in, um, in John, John chapter 18, as long as we're in John, we'll just stay there. But John chapter 18 and verses 38, uh, 33 through 38. So I ask you to turn to that. And while you're turning to that, whenever I do Bible studies, um, I always mention, um, you know, it's a good thing when you're in your core and you're uh, reading the scripture for the Sunday morning holiness meeting. Um, when you announce the scripture, you know what's a good idea? Let us find the scripture before you start reading. That's really a good idea. Uh, give us time to find the scripture so that we can follow along with you while you're reading. Sometimes scriptures are announced and then immediately the person starts reading and we're still scrambling to try to find it. You know, so. so I'll try to be faithful, as faithful as I can to that anyways during our time together. But look at uh, 33 uh, of that. This is that, again, confrontation in a sense with Pilate. Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Notice Pilate's picking up on this kingdom language. Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingship is not from this world. Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And then Pilate said to him, what is truth? Pilate wanted to change the direction of this conversation because he was getting very uncomfortable with his, all this kingship kind of language. But you notice what Jesus said, my kingship is not from this world. Now what he means by that is that my right to reign my right to rule does not come from this world. It does not come from any worldly authority. No worldly person, no king, um, no priest, no pilot has given me the right to rule. My kingship is not from this world. My right to re reign and rule is not from my, this world. My right to reign and my right to rule comes from God and God alone. So there's this kind of message of the kingship, and there's this good imagery of the kingship as the reign of God. So when we think of the kingdom of God, not necessarily a place, but as the rule of God. Uh, that's what we want to kind of keep our, keep our kind of minds focused on that during our Bible study together. So the, the meanings of the word kingdom. Now, the kingdom's a redemptive rule of God for sure. What I love about the Bible is that is that there are so many ways to express this. There are so many ways to understand this. Uh, there are so many kind of metaphors and images that can be used to talk about uh, the kingdom of God as the redemptive rule of God. Um, let me well, just mention number one without turning to it, but it's obviously you've got the references, John 3, 3, and 5. Don't you love the imagery of the new birth as a way of talking about your entrance into the kingdom of God by faith. I think probably I'm so interested to hear the stories last night and be so interested to hear your stories um, during this week. But uh, certainly some of you would describe your Christian coming into the Christian faith as a new birth, 
Uh, you were born again. You were born from above. Well, you can thank the Gospel of John for that. The Gospel of John gave you that language to use. And it's a lovely way to describe, in a sense, the reign of God in your life, the redemptive rule of God in your life. You've been born again. You've come into the family of God. Uh, and that's a beautiful kind of Johannine way of describing it. I love that one. Let's turn to the other two. Let's turn, first of all, to Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Uh, this could almost be a... Um, this could almost be the, 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 the verses for this whole time together, but um, I love this, um, this business of Colossians 1, 13 and 14, deliverance. Um, so the first imagery is an imagery of being born again, coming into the family of God. The second imagery is this imagery of being delivered, however. So look at Colossians 1, 13, 14. It doesn't get better than this. He's delivered us from the dominion of darkness, and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What a beautiful image this is. He's delivered us, and he has, as some of your Bibles would read, he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So we now live by his own action. We live in the kingdom of God. We live in the kingdom of his beloved son. Really a beautiful imagery. Look at the Romans imagery for a moment, will you? Romans 14, 17. Here's a third kind of uh, lovely imagery here about the kingdom of God. Romans uh, 14, 17. And this is an imagery, I, I mean, this verse, what a great verse this is. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God does not mean food and drink, but it means righteousness, it means peace, and it means joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. One definition of the kingdom of God, that third definition, is a definition of sanctification. It's a definition of holiness. It's a definition of both the community and the individual living a holy life in Christ. And what's the manifestation? The manifestation is we live in a right relationship with each other, with ourselves. We live in a, in a time of shalom. We live in a, in a place of peace in our own hearts and lives. And we live in joy. We rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, Paul said. So isn't that beautiful imagery for what life is really like in the kingdom of God? So I love that imagery as well. So when we talk about the kingdom of God as the redemptive rule of God, oh, the Bible uses so much different kind of imagery. This is such a rich, rich word, kingdom, that there are, we need all kinds of ways to describe it. So these are some ways to describe that. So, All right. Now, uh, how do we respond to all this? What's, what's going on with our life in the kingdom of God? Well, first of all, we must seek the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not just something that's kind of dropped on us. Uh, we must keep seeking for the kingdom of God, which means, okay, what does the kingdom of God mean? The kingdom of God means the rule of God, the reign of God in my life. I want to keep seeking for the reign of God in my life. I want to keep praying for that. So we must seek the kingdom of God. Secondly, we must receive the kingdom of God in childlike simplicity. So there's no great complicated way to receive God's kingdom. Uh, we receive it as children, uh, childlike simplicity, uh, beautiful, beautiful kind of imagery here. So um, thirdly, we have assurance that we are the disciples of Christ. So being in the kingdom of God means we always have a heart of assurance. Uh, we always have a life of assurance. We always know that we know that we are the children of God. And when we talk about assurance, I mentioned John Wesley's great uh, experience, May 24th, 1738, when he said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. Well, that was not Wesley's conversion. He was already a believer. John Wesley was already a believer when he came to this experience. But he did not have the assurance in his heart that he was a believer. And so in that great experience, um, we and maybe, maybe in our time together on Friday, we can talk a little more about this great event, but in that great experience, John Wesley received that assurance. I hope you have the assurance that you are in the kingdom of God, that, you, that God is reigning in your life, that he's ruling in your life. I hope it's not enough just for that to be a fact. Um, we need to embrace that fact. We need to be sure of that fact always, you know, that we are in the kingdom of God. Now, 
here's a little, here's a little, sometimes the gospel is good news, sometimes it's hard news. Here's a little hard news I need to give to you. Um, and uh, boy, I think, you know, um, I was just out in Chicago with the Army at what they call CBLI, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a Bible and Leadership Institute. Um, Colonel Munn was there and some other folks, but, um, and I was doing uh, some, some of this material on the kingdom of God. And before the conference, <clears throat> they wrote to me and they said, well, what you know, are there any specific songs that you'd like us to sing? Because before the Bible study, we sang a little bit, and then we went into the Bible study. And um, so I wrote back to them, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but I said to them, oh, you know, songs about the kingdom. But please, if you've got some song that's talking about building the kingdom, please don't sing that, whatever you do. So, so they were very kind, and they, we never sang a song about building the kingdom. However, I know that in evangelical circles, there are songs about building the kingdom of God. So here, I'd like to make it as clear as I possibly can. We do not build the kingdom of God. Uh, we receive the kingdom of God in its fullness in Christ. So there's nothing left to build. It's nothing, it's nothing like something lacking here that we have to build. So if I could encourage you, too, in your own homeland, um, please don't sing any songs about building the kingdom of God, because you don't need to build the kingdom of God. It's come in its fullness in Christ. Now, and I make this point here in the PowerPoint, we do build the church because the church is the body of Christ. So we can build the church. Or as one uh, theologian uh, said, we can build for the kingdom. So we build the church for the sake of the kingdom, for the kingdom, but we do not build the kingdom of God. So if possible, during our time together, um, if we could maybe not uh, sing about building the kingdom of God, I would rejoice in that greatly. Um, so, uh, so please note uh, what, what that part in that, uh, about the kingdom of God. Okay, so after we've kind of submitted ourselves in this, in this way, we inherit the kingdom of God and we become members of the kingdom of God, of course. Now, here's a second thing. You know, the, again, gospel is good news, and it's, and it's difficult news, though. We can suffer for the kingdom of God. There's no question about that. When Christ calls us, he calls us to come and die. So we've already put our lives on the line, haven't we, for Christ and for his kingdom. Some of you may be called upon to suffer for the kingdom. Uh, and if so, so be it. Um, now, um, this is, um, you know, I teach at Gordon College, and just north of Boston, and I teach um, to basically um, Christians, wonderful Christian students who have lived in the Western world, pretty comfortable lives, basically from comfortable churches and from lovely homes and so forth. And I need to keep reminding them that this is not the norm of the Christian church. The comfortable world in which we live is not how it has been in history, and it's not how it is today for many Christians. Uh, uh, the, the, the church has been a suffering church, and the kingdom has suffered, and it still suffers today. And it, what a lovely place we are, privileged to meet in this place, aren't we? Uh, but we need to remember that the church out there and the kingdom out there is, is suffering. So we, can, we may be called upon to suffer for the kingdom of God. Certainly that's been true for 2,000 years. And we certainly can work for the kingdom of God, no doubt about that. So. Now, we want to just remind ourselves that the kingdom of God is like a two-sided coin. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he often mentions this, as a matter of fact. But it's like a coin with two sides to it. On the one side of the coin, in other words, if you, if you take the coin, it's got two sides to it. If you take the coin and cut it in half, the coin is worthless. It doesn't, it's not worth anything anymore. It's only worthwhile if the coin is whole. And that's true with our understanding of the kingdom. The kingdom is like a coin with two sides, and the two sides, as you can see, is on the one hand, the kingdom of God is dynamic. The kingdom of God comes in power. The kingdom of God comes in glory, you know? That's part of the kingdom of God. And certainly we see that in the life and ministry of Jesus when we see his great miracles and so forth. We'll be looking at some of the representative miracles. So there is a, there is a dynamism, there's a dynamite, there's a power to the kingdom of God. So we see that. Okay, the other side of the kingdom of God, however, is that the kingdom of God is also a mystery. 
So there's something about the kingdom of God that is not yet revealed. Now, by mystery, we don't mean mystery. Uh, we mean mystery in the New Testament sense, not mystery in the sense that we think of it. If I'm reading a mystery novel, you know, um, trying to find out, you know, the end here. But mystery in the New Testament sense is something long hidden that is ultimately revealed, ultimately kind of demonstrated to us. But the, the point is that the kingdom of God is both of those things at the same time. So there's a wonderful power to the kingdom, but at the same time, there's a mystery to the kingdom. There's a mystery to the kingdom, but there is also a power to the kingdom. Some of you would be familiar with the, um, with the um, we, we won't talk about this when we talk about the parables, but the parable of the mustard seed. So some of you would be familiar with that parable. Parable of the mustard seed, and you plant the seed into the ground and it grows. The problem with that parable is people too quickly go to the second half of it where, where Jesus says the, the mustard seed then grows, which is interesting because the parable of the mustard seed is not a parable about growth. It's a parable about hiddenness. It's the first part of the parable that's the most important. The mustard seed is like the smallest of seed that's, you know, you plant it into the ground and it's hidden there. That's really what the parable is talking about because at that particular time, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God as hidden, um, not as growth and so forth. So, so we've got to kind of be careful how we deal with these parables, um, but there is, there is definitely a mystery to the kingdom of God. There is no question about that. So it's both at the same time. Now, what we'd like to do is just give a quick introduction to the parables, look at some representative parables. Let's try this um, and, and see how we do with this. Let's stop here for just a minute or two and see if there are some questions as you become, as we become familiar with each other and as we get to know each other, you'll, you'll become, um, maybe it'll be easier for you to ask questions. Or, but on the introductory material, on the kingdom of God, let's see if there are any questions, anything I need to kind of pull together uh, before we get into some of these parables that demonstrate so well the kingdom of God. Is there anything that anybody wants to uh, talk about in terms of just the introductory material? either the introduction to the Bible study, just in general, or the introductory material to what the kingdom of God is all about, as the reign or the rule of God. Yes, we have one here. I was just wondering, um, when you were talking about the temple, uh, yes. Jesus coming into the temple and throwing everyone out. Yes. I was wondering with that, uh, if you could clear up for me, uh, just a little thing. It says, the temple courts. Yes. And I was wondering if that's significant because that would be where the Gentiles would go and, and pray around the temple. Right. And I wonder if that has any significance of when Jesus says, the holies of holies. Right. About and himself. If, he's the holy Right. Of and if that, if he's almost saying to the Jews, this is their place too. Right, that's a good question. Let's go back to that story for just a minute. It's very interesting, first of all, in that story, it's interesting that in the Gospel of John, you'll notice that story comes at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, but in the other Gospels, it comes at the end of Jesus' ministry. It's the last thing he does before he enters into Jerusalem and so forth, or after he enters into Jerusalem. So it's interesting that we have these two accounts of the, um, of the you know, confrontation with these money changers. Um, and, and many people feel that this event happened twice at least and may have happened a, quite a bit with Jesus because he was in such confrontation with the leaders and with their understanding of their kind of temple religion. So I don't think that every time they saw Jesus coming, they kicked over their own tables just to save, <laughs> let's save this guy a little bit of work here, but um, uh, save him a little bit of hassle. But I don't think that happened. But certainly, um, certainly there is this confrontation that Jesus is having with the authorities. Now it is Passover, so the place would be absolutely packed uh, with pilgrims coming for Passover. There, this is in the court of Gentiles, so there would also be Gentiles hearing this as well. So it wouldn't be limited to the Jewish people, but it'd be predominantly um, the Jewish people because they are focusing at Passover on that temple and they're going to make sacrifices. And what is Jesus upset with? What is he upset with? He's upset with these people have a religious obligation and there are people in that outer court who are kind of ripping them off. They're charging much more than they should 
for the sacrifices that have to be made, and they're charging much more than they should for changing the money in order to buy the sacrifices that have to be made. So Jesus is really in confrontation with these people who are taking a religious observation and they're degrading it, really. And so, so I think this would be predominantly Jews at this time, but it is in the court of Gentiles, so there's certainly, Gentiles would certainly be welcome there, but the place would be absolutely packed when he says this. And then when Jews hear this, they're gonna hear Jesus saying about himself as the temple, and not only but the temple, but the holy of holies. So they're gonna be rather amazed by this message. Something else while we've stopped for just a minute? Sir. Yeah, we'll just pass over the microphone, that'll be uh, In our language, they translated, we should enter in the kingdom, but you say that we should receive the kingdom. Yes. So it means that we should enter in the kingdom of God, so it should be future, why it should be in heaven. But uh, if you say that we should receive a kingdom right. uh, in our heart or inside, so right. what is different? How do we receive do or yep. enter? Yes. Well, that's just language we use. Once we receive Christ and accept Christ as the personal Savior, once he is the ruler of our lives, once he is reigning and ruling in our lives, we are already members of the kingdom because he is the kingdom of God. He is the holy of holies. He is the temple. So uh, we are already members of the kingdom. Not only individually, too, I should say, but that Colossians passage is plural. Uh, he has delivered us, all of us. He has delivered us as a community of people. He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So uh, receiving Christ is not a separate act from receiving the kingdom. When we, become, uh, when we receive Christ, we are now members of the kingdom. Does that make sense? And then his kingdom is ruling and reigning in our lives, in our hearts. Yeah. Yeah. Something else while we stopped. I love this more than anything, more than lecturing, actually. But I, I know that our time, we, we, we're our time based. But there's the microphone right there. We'll just ask you to use the mic. And um, I'm a, you were talking about um, definitely not talking about building the kingdom of God. Yes. And it may be the rhetoric, but I got a little bit confused um, because. Um, you'd said that it was fine to talk about building up the church and building up the body of Christ. Yes. However, right. earlier you'd also said that Jesus spoke of his body as the kingdom of God. Right. And in that sense, if I followed it sort of logically, it would, every time we added to the body of Christ would be adding to the kingdom of God. Right. So I got a little bit confused by That's, that. Thank you for thank that, you. Uh, to clarify that. But um, we don't want uh, J Jesus as the physical body, as the physical person, the word made flesh. Jesus, as the word made flesh, is now in heaven at the right hand of God and ruling in heaven with his kingdom and so forth. When we talk about the church as the body of Christ, that's an imagery that we use for the church. Um, it's one of many imageries. We could talk about the church as the bride of Christ, for example. But I think a predominant imagery in the New Testament is that the church is the body of Christ. Not the body of Christ in the same way that Jesus in his risen body is sitting with God in heaven, but the body of Christ as a, a metaphorical way of talking about his church here, here on earth. So we can, we can develop that church. We can grow that church for the sake, we grow it for the sake of the kingdom. Because the main job of the church is to do what? It's to preach the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe this gospel. So we can definitely grow the church because it's an organic, a living thing. So it can, it can grow. Right, yeah, the, there, is a, there is a body of Jesus, a uh, physical body of Jesus, the word become flesh, but there is also his church on earth as the body of Christ. There's those two things, that's true. Well, let's, why don't we do this? Um, let's just, well, I'm sorry, let's just look at that introduction. We're gonna give some representative parables and um, we'll be careful to watch our time here. But let me give a couple of words by way of introduction to the parables themselves. The parables, of course, are the stories of Jesus. It's the stories that he tells. Um, and you'd be familiar with, the, with, the story, with so many of the parables of Jesus. If you look at the New Testament, um, he probably told about 50 parables. But this was not new to Jesus because teaching by parables was the Jewish, way, the Jewish thing to do. 
the Jewish stories of which there were hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of Jewish stories. So Jesus as a good rabbi is not doing something unique. He's not doing something different uh, from his own Jewish culture and background. He's telling stories. Now, of course, the little bit of a twist on his stories are his stories point to himself and to the kingdom of God. Uh, they're not just general stories. Um, so there's, there's, a, um, there's a, a really a wonderful thing here. So. Now, also by way of introduction, let me just, uh, here's a Sunday school definition of parable. You have probably heard this, so you don't need me here to teach you this, but uh, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Have, how many of you have heard that? An earthly story with a, four of us have heard that. Okay, well, this is a little scary. Uh, maybe five of us. And a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So uh, the word parable literally, literally comes from the way of sowing seeds into the ground. You, you sow seeds and then into one part of the ground and then next to it you sow some more seeds and next to it you sow some more seeds. So uh, there's, there's kind of a, a parable is, is things that stand side by side with each other. Uh, now, as we'll see, sometimes parables are parables of contrast that is, they are, it's a story that Jesus tells in order to contrast to something else. Sometimes they're parables of comparison. It's a story that Jesus tells to compare to something else. So parables have those you know, meanings that we'll kind of want to watch for. So we should take note about that. Okay, just let me mention one more thing about parables. Maybe two. I should probably mention two more things. The next to the last would be this. You'll notice, even Jesus says this, but when Jesus is teaching parables about the kingdom, you'll notice that the parable is understood by believers and it's not understood by non-believers. So one story serves two purposes. One story, that same story, people who want to believe, people of faith, they're going to understand this story. And sometimes they'll ask Jesus for further understanding, you know? But people who don't believe, who aren't people of faith in the kingdom, they're not going to understand the story. Jesus meant the story to have those two effects. He meant the same story to be understood by believers and to be kind of dense to non-believers, which is very interesting. And sometimes he says that, and probably we'll see a couple of passages like that. So, Okay, could I say one more thing about parables? Um, and then we'll just take a time for maybe just one or two just to start with. And I think probably in the next session tomorrow morning, maybe we'll pick up a little bit with parables and then before we move into to miracles. But um, just one more thing about parables. Parables are, uh, we need to be careful with interpreting parables in, in the Bible. Because basically, parables are trying to teach us one basic thing about the kingdom of God. So when you're dealing with the parables, I would encourage you, when you're preaching on the parables or teaching on the parables, I would encourage you to find that one basic truth. That, and I'm going to try to help you with the representative parables, but find that one basic truth. I think in terms of principles of biblical interpretation, which are very important, there are certain right ways to interpret the Bible, and there are wrong ways to interpret the Bible. But I think in terms of bib uh, principles of biblical interpretation, we need to watch out with the parables especially, because a, a preacher sometimes could take one parable and find ten different meanings out of that one parable. And you wonder if they're stretching that story far beyond what it was ever intended to be. I think we need to be careful of that. Um, let's find the one basic meaning, and then let's see how that relates to the kingdom. I think that's what's really important about the parables. So why don't we just, so that we get kind of our mindset onto the parables a little bit, why don't we just take at least one here, and we'll, we'll talk about that one as representative. And so if you look with me, this is a famous parable. Maybe it's one of the best known parables, and it's Luke 8, uh, 4 through 15. So I'll, I'll ask you to turn to Luke 8. All right, and for sake of time, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it, but I'll read, I'll read right along here, 4 through 15. What is this parable about? Parable of the sower. It's about a hostile kingdom against God's kingdom. That is, it's a parable about people standing against the kingdom of God. Uh, that's what it's really intended to be. So Luke 8, 4. When a great crowd came together and people from town after town came to hear him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. 
As he sowed, some fell along the path and was trodden underfoot. The birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When his disciples asked him what this parable meant. Now, see, there's a good indication. Parables are for believers. So his disciples want to know about this parable. They want to understand this. Okay, so when, and then in verse 10, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, they are in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. And that's in keeping, isn't it, with what we said a parable accomplishes. Uh, for the believer, you can see, for, but the parable about the kingdom, for non-believers, they'll not see, they'll not understand. So, Okay, and then he says in 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, the ones along the path are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, that they may not believe and be saved, and the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word of God, receive it with joy, but they have no root, they believe for a while, and in time of temptation they fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. And as for that in good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bring forth fruit with patience. So this is the parable of the sower. Now you'll notice that Jesus meant this parable to be a story of hostility against the kingdom of God. He meant it to be a story of how people are hostile against God's kingdom and God's message. Now, the first three categories of people are people who fall into that category of hostility. There is a wonderful last group of people, of course, who um, receive it with an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So we're rejoicing in that. There's some good news that comes out of this hard news. But if you don't see the parable as a, as a parable of hostility, against the kingdom of God, I think you're kind of missing the reason he preached the parable. And in fact, he actually kind of mentions that uh, right in the, in the um, story itself. Now, if you look at Luke 8, 19 through 21, we'll see the result of the parable. Every, almost every parable, not every parable, but almost every parable, there's a result of the story. There's, there's, a, there's something happens after the story is told. And look at uh, 8, 19. And his mother and his brothers came to him. They could not reach him for the crowd, and he was told, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside, desiring to see you. But he said to them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now, this, this, there's good that comes out of this parable of hostility, because some people believe. Remember we said some people believe. Um, Jesus is actually, uh, can you imagine how... How good you would feel when Jesus said this, because you are a poor person, you've got nobody, you've got no connections, you might uh, worship maybe other gods or something. I mean, your life is in pretty bad shape. You might not even have any family, you might be a servant in that world, a slave in that world, and so forth. Can you imagine how blessed they must feel when Jesus said, you are now part of my family. Welcome to my family. Because everybody who hears the word and does it is my family. So Jesus is welcoming people into his family. It's his family. Yeah? Uh, it's, not that, um, it's not that Jesus was saying a bad thing about his mothers or brothers or his family, of course. Um, but that he, he was saying that as a result of this parable. Uh, there is a good ending to this story, and it's the story that everybody is welcome into the kingdom of God who believes. And not only they're welcome into the kingdom of God, but they're part of my family, Jesus said. People who were without family, people who had nothing, people who had nothing of this world's goods, had no family, people who had no one to cling to, people who felt that they were demonized by the rest of culture and society, they've got a family now, and it's Jesus' family they belong to. So that's awfully good news, you know, that comes from the parable. But this is basically a parable of hostility against the kingdom. And what we'll do, I think, in tomorrow's session, then we'll pick up with a couple of parables and then go on to the miracles. So bless your hearts. Thank you for this and for your attention. And uh, we'll see you in just a few minutes after the break.